How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a multi award winning podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. For over a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics in over 200 episodes. For the past three years, DNA Today has won the People's Choice Best Science and Medicine Podcast Award. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. <laughs> In 2020, a direct consumer DNA test revealed that our guest Richard Wenzel's father was not his genetic father. Since that troubling discovery, Richard has dedicated his efforts towards increasing education and awareness among medical professionals about the harms of false genetic narratives, identifying opportunities to improve the care provided to children and adults incurring in false narratives, and urging for research. Richard is also a certified professional in patient safety. Before we begin, I do want to provide a trigger warning that this episode's discussion may contain the topic of sexual assault. It's also not recommended for younger listeners, thinking of people in high school and younger. Also want to recommend checking out episode 241 of DNA Today as I sat down with longtime TV show, talk show host, NBC's Maury Povich, um, aka his tagline, I would say, is you are the father, you are not the father. Um, So I got to sit down with him at NBC's studio and capture his insight on paternity testing as he's tested, I don't know, hundreds, if not maybe a thousand um, people in paternity testing situations um, on TV. Um, So it pairs well, I think, with with this episode and Richard's thoughts. So Richard, thank you so much for coming on the show. And, you know, you're about to share your, your story. So thank you so much just for taking the time to come on and really letting my audience in on just your life and your story. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you for, for letting me come. And yeah, I'm, I uh, will use my story to supplement a, 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 what I see as a, as a bigger issue. And that is how healthcare professionals are handling the uh, increasingly more common situation of unexpectedly discovering misattributed paternity and how they respond in those circumstances. And just sort of to provide some context of what I'm talking about here, <clears throat> I think in two scenarios this is this is more common. One is with pediatricians, so something that happens every day, a parent or both parents take their child to the pediatrician for a checkup or what have you, and in the course of providing care, the pediatrician may come, you know, some lab report or some other information that says the genetic relationship. Particularly, you know, we're talking about mis, or at least my case was misattributed paternity. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So the stated relationship between the child and the father is not, genetically speaking, is not so. So that's one scenario. The other scenario is when, again, uh, and I'm just for my whole talk going to use this hypothetical married couple with a child. You know, they go to someone like yourself, they want some genetic testing. Maybe they have a child already that has some genetic disease and they want to understand better how that happened or understand better how maybe a future child, uh, you know, what risks might be for them. So those are sort of the two scenarios I'm, I'm talking about. And in that situation, the professional can either disclose factual genetic information or act towards non-disclosure of of factual information. And that's sort of the the debate we're going to engage today. And um, although although I want to be specific, I'm not talking about or advocating forcing parents to say anything, right? There is a distinction between the obligations of what parents have and what medical licensed medical professionals have. And particularly when you realize that in some of those circumstances, Parents are in the midst of, you know, lots of emotions. They're unaware of what resources are there to help them. They're unaware of long-term consequences and so forth. So just to be clear, a parent or really anyone cannot be compelled to say anything that they don't want to say. Everyone has the right to remain silent, so to speak. What I am saying and what I am advocating is that in contrast to parents, medical professionals have years of, you know, didactic and clinical training. We are licensed, which obligates us to various ethical and legal standards, and also permits others to critique and reprimand our actions in the aftermath. So like parents, professionals cannot be compelled to say something they do not wish to say, whether that's verbalize, document, or otherwise communicate false information. 
especially, and that's one thing I want to be uh, clear about with here with genetics. Genetics, and particularly when we're talking about you know paternity between a, a child and, and their father, it's objective, it can be determined, it can be verified, and it's never going to be changed. Right, so that's in contrast. I think I don't. I don't know if you mentioned. You know, I'm a pharmacist. I've spent many years working in the acute care setting. You know, I, I can recall situations where people had cancer or these types of things, and we're thinking about, oh, what's their chance of survival and everything else. It's very gray. It's very, you know, you're not certain. In this case, with genetics, are you or are you not? It's a yes/no question. So that's what we're talking about. And what I'm advocating is healthcare professionals should choose not to be an active participant in deception. And this is an important thing because, you know, we don't have very good uh, epidemiologic data about misattributed paternity, which frankly is a, is a bit of a failure, you know, on, on the genetic world's part. You know, misattributed paternity isn't something new. This isn't COVID. As long as, hu as, long as humans have been around, this has likely been around. But anyway, our best estimate is somewhere between three to seven million people are, you know, are impacted by this. And obviously, I'm, I'm um, one of them. And it's a lot more people than than I think people realize. Like I've even heard as high as ten percent being quoted of 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 people having misattributed parentage, especially paternity, is is more common. I mean, that seems very high to me. Yeah, you will find even higher numbers in the literature, although there's you know methodology uh, criticism as to how they had to ascertain that number. But that's my point. We you know it's very difficult to solve a problem when you don't even know the extent of the problem. So that's something. So if anyone out there listening right now is uh, getting their PhD or their master's and they need a research project, there's several things I'll identify here. Some great, what I think would be great research projects. But anyway, <clears throat> when I was in practice, I had lots of students. When I'm going to, you know, examine some of these big questions, I think a great place to start is to look at professional organizations' guidelines or position statements or or similar similar documents. You know, they often summarize the data, they often grade the data, they often identify unanswered questions. So I'm going to take a few minutes here to talk about first. About guidelines that apply to all of healthcare. So whether you're tr it's a genetics issue, whether you're treating diabetes, whether you're treating a broken arm, what have you. And then I'm going to get into some uh, organization specific recommendations for the management of genetic issues. So first, let's talk about some national organizations, things relevant to day-to-day -day healthcare. And at least in my opinion, when you're talking about um, you know ethics, if you will, or position statements, you have to go to the American Medical Association. They're they're largest, they're the oldest, they are arguably the most influential in society and in politics. So if you go to their, um, which is publicly available, their um, code of ethics, the American Medical Association says, quote, excluding emergencies, withholding information without the patient's knowledge or consent is ethically unacceptable, end quote. You know, in some ways, I think we can stop this, stop this lecture right now. I mean, look, there's what it says. But anyway, I will go on. It says, quote, when information is withheld, convey that information once the emergency is resolved, end quote. And I don't think we can argue that misattributed paternity is an emergency situation so and then they also say yeah, not usually yeah and they yeah. also say a physician quote a physician shall be honest in all professional interactions and strive to report physicians engaging in fraud and dece or deception end quote now that comment brings up the question of for those healthcare professionals who are engaging in conveying knowingly conveying false genetic information such as non-disclosure of misattributed paternity should they be reported to the licensing board? Right? And again, that's not my opinion. That's straight from the AMA. It's surprising because to me, like that shows, not shows, but like it's, it's really saying and going against medical providers covering up misattributed paternity. Like it, it seems to go directly against that line that you just wrote. And we'll put that in the show notes for people that want to check out the code of ethics there. Th this idea of be honest with your patients, provide your patients with factual information. This is not some radical idea that I just invented yesterday. It's been the cornerstone, <laughs> right. cornerstone of healthcare for probably a few centuries, right? So they also say, quote, withholding pertinent medical information creates conflict between the physician's obligations to promote patient welfare and respect patient autonomy, end quote. And then here, I like this one. They talk about patients' rights. Quote, patients have a right to know their past and present medical status and to be free of any mistaken beliefs. End quote. I mean, I, I can go on. There's some other things here, but you get the idea. I, I also note that the AMA, their uh, adult family, and the AMA is American Medical Association, their adult family history form specifically asks for biological father and biological mother. And the AMA, like a number of medical organizations, specifically endorses the value 
of a family medical history. And they say, quote, a properly collected family history can identify whether a patient has a higher risk for disease and a number of other benefits uh, for time. I'm not going to read all of them. So that's the AMA. When you talk about the health care provided for children, you have to go to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Again, I would argue they are the most important and influential organization um, uh, here in the United States. Their patient and family-centered care policy says, quote, pediatricians should share medical information with children in, and families in ways that are useful and affirming. This information should be complete, honest, and unbiased, end quote. So that's, I think, you know, that's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. And they also say, and this, they, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics is the only place where I found this. They say, quote, physicians must realize that informed consent and refusal constitutes a process, not a discrete event, end quote. And I think that's important. It's the only place I found, certainly I've read all the, 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 you know, genetics literature about managing misattributed paternity. And the overwhelming majority of it comes at it from this perspective of, you know, what is the clinician going to do in the next 15 minutes, right? It's, it's this yes or no phenomena. Are you going to tell right now or are you not going to tell? And that's the end of it. And the reality is that is not, that is just simply not, that is simply not reality, right? But so much of the literature and so many of the arguments for non-disclosure come from that perspective. I think I would argue that so much of the literature is geared towards not offering bona fide therapeutic benefit for the patients, you know, the family. It's geared towards how do I keep the healthcare professional out of becoming embroiled in some difficult family dynamics? Right, because you don't know sometimes the circumstances when pediatricians especially because they're usually the ones that are you know a little more involved if they are not aware of the background and learning this information they don't know like well does the biological mother and I'll use mother father terms you know just to be a little bit more straightforward but you know does that biological mother know of the non-paternity do they know but then haven't told the child or like doesn't want that to come up does the does the dad that is in the picture and raising this child also know there's so many dynamics at play so it's like you don't know are you uncovering something that that parent or those two parents don't want to know and you're going to disrupt a family or like are you like well i i have a a medical necessity and like duty to warn almost like we we had an episode talking about duty to warn with Janice Berliner a few few episodes ago like so there, there's so many dynamics at play there well well and a couple of thoughts about that I, I listened to your duty to warn episode but that's you know do you have a duty to warn some some genetic relative that you're at risk for Alzheimer's that's one thing you know this child this man is or is not the biological you know that's not a disease Right, that's just a right. straightforward it's in a fact. So different category, right? So, yeah. So, so th that's number one. Um, number two, this this idea of disrupting the family. Again, I spent years in acute care. On a daily basis, we told people like, "We have to amputate your leg." Well, guess what? That disrupts the patient and their family. We told people you had liver failure. We told people, you know, you you, you need to go to substance abuse treatment. We told people we think this is child abuse. We have to alert the Department of Children and Family Services. The idea that healthcare professionals should never do anything I, that might potentially disrupt a patient or a family. Again, I have a hard time. Look, at, I, I'm not happy about it. You know, it's difficult. But my view of a healthcare professional is, and certainly what I experienced is, we're there to help people in some of their most vulnerable, scared days. Our job is to help people make a choice when they have nothing but bad choices. Right? That's how I view that. And it's been surprising and disappointing to me when reviewing the genetics literature because it's not something I did until recently just this idea oh we can't and, and again this idea that it's we should prioritize a a fiction you know a, a false narrative over reality I have a difficult time accepting that and I have a difficult time understanding what are the long-term benefits of that but anyway I, I, I digress let me get back to the guidelines I'll just point out that the American Academy of Pediatrics also talks about the value of a factual uh, a family medical history interestingly the Academy does specifically cite adoption as a barrier to a complete family history but they do not make any comment about donor conception or misattributed paternity being a barrier I don't know whether that's design or by just simply an oversight. I think that's probably just an oversight. What do you mean by barrier? <clears throat> that, that yeah, if, if I'm an adoptee, I don't know who my biological parents are. So I can't tell you who. Oh, barrier in terms of medical information. Yeah, I can't tell you who died from a heart history. attack oh, or who it. had colon cancer or what have you. Yes. Sure. Yes. And so. Yes. And when you have misattributed parentage, especially you think 
the father in your life is your biological father. You think for, you know, in, until you discover this truth yeah. that, oh, this is all my my biological family history. Right. It's, which it sounds like was kind of in, in your oh, case, a, a, too. <laughs> How much time you got? I don't know if we want to get, into, right. get yeah. into that. But, yeah, it's this double whammy. And, number one, you lack factual information. And, number two, that factual information has been replaced with false information. So, so it is, so it is a a uh, a double whammy. Completely misleading. I mean, that's an that's an underwhelming statement. You know, I looked at all the guidelines, and one thing about them: none of them are based on empiric evidence. All of them are only opinion and conjecture from healthcare professionals. All of them lack, you know, the child's voices. You know, people like me, my voice, and I think that's a a huge deficiency, particularly in situations where you don't have longitudinal studies or or controlled trials. It's even more essential. To, to hear from the people that this affects, and that just simply is, is not there. So the other thing, in the past roughly year and a half, two years, there have been several studies come out, uh, qualitative research people have done looking at people who have discovered misattributed paternity via direct-to-consumer DNA tests, such as myself. So whatever empiric evidence we now have is from that, and that evidence needs to be incorporated into the guidelines. You know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over all of them, but I want to highlight a couple of them. Probably the biggest one was from an author, Avni. It was published in Psychiatric Research about a year ago. And I'll just read the conclusion from their abstract. It says, quote, results demonstrated increased levels of depression, anxiety, and panic symptoms Relative to controls, this study actually had controls in it, which obviously makes its results more result, more robust. And they say, quote, the ability to openly discuss the discovery and acceptance of it were identified as protective factors against psychological issues, end quote. I mean, imagine that. When you talk about things openly and honestly, people do better. What a radical idea. So... Right. So there was another article published by lead author was Grethel it was in family relations. This was a smaller study. It had about 27 uh, people they looked at. But they say, quote, identity transformation after unexpected DNA results is often accompanied by a shift in identity related to race, ethnicity, religion, family status and belonging. Temporal trauma, grief and loss are com common outcomes. Isolation, shame, and lack of emotional support are prevalent, end quote. All right, and that's one thing I want to point out, because if you read the arguments for non-disclosure of misattributed paternity discovery, they overwhelmingly assume that the child is oblivious to and unaffected by the deception, and that is simply false. So... There was another big study of more, it was 600 individuals, although this was a mix of adoptees, donor conceived, and misattributed paternity people. It was, uh, lead author was Lawton, that was in the Journal of Family History about a year ago. But it said, specific to misattributed paternity, roughly one of five respondents no longer speak with their raising mother, and roughly one in 10 no longer speak with their raising father. End quote. And I just can't help but think if they had known this information years before, that would have provided them years to, you know, cope with this, to understand this, to work through this. That's something that they were denied. Yeah, I'm surprised with that, that those stats aren't flipped. I would think more people would have a, rela a relationship or non-relationship with their father after learning this, but you're saying more of it is with their mother. Yeah. That's surprising. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I most guess of their mother a, may be the a, one that's containing this information. The father may have no idea. Correct. Absolutely. That was the case with me. And actually speaking of me in my case, and they do say here, quote, lack of genetic mirroring during childhood can lead to lower self-esteem and feelings of disconnectedness from the raising family. Often children can sense when something is being kept from them that can create all these bad things, end quote. Which and you that talk is absolutely about in your article. Like you talk about that experience. From my youngest childhood memories, I knew something somehow was not right about my dad being my dad. I also knew that no one in my family not only looked like me, but no one really acted like me. My younger siblings, my dad, you know, I stood out. Actually, one of the most, I don't know, depressing, sad moments I had in this whole journey. I have a friend, Marty. He and I have been friends since high school, you know, 40 years. And um, I called him up after this and I said, you know, oh, Marty, I you know, took this test, blah, blah, blah. I explained the whole thing. 
And just it was what he said and also how he said it. He goes, oh, Rich, you've always been the odd one in your family. So Marty was not surprised. Your childhood friend was like not surprised. Yeah, my best friend has seen this his whole life. It was so obvious to him, right? It just, yeah, that just hit me. And then, and I talk about it in my article. Yeah, I finally, my genetic father, he he died in 2006. I never met him. And I received a, a photo of him. He actually went to prison twice, uh, which is bad in terms of he went to prison, but it's good in the sense that there were all these records that I was able to obtain and actually, one of them had a photo of him. He's 26 years old in a photo, and he looks exactly like we, we're twins. And I had never in my life seen anyone that looked How like How did that feel looking at that photo? Like, what, what were your reactions? All this stuff finally makes sense. And you see somebody who looks like you and so on and so forth. In any event, my, my point with all this is, yeah, we now have data that clearly shows the negative consequences of this secrecy, and, and there's more data coming. I personally have participated in two other research projects. I have no doubt that the, I mean, the results will be out, who knows, in a year or so. I have no doubt the results are gonna sh continue to show all this negative impact. So, um, and it's, <clears throat> and I, I think the other big failure of current guidelines and non-disclosure recommendations is none specifically recommend assessing how the misattributed paternity is affecting the child there is this, again, as I mentioned before, this assumption that the child is oblivious to and incurring no harm from the deception, and that is absolutely false. The other thing, actually, Jody klugman Rab, she's a psychologist out in the West Coast. She discovered a few years ago her true genetic story. She's misattributed paternity, and she actually recently completed her PhD dissertation. She, she did qualitative research with uh, misattributed paternity individuals, and what she found, she had more than 130 people what she, one of her key results is 39% always experience feeling different from their known family. So almost right? half. Four, four out of 10 people know something. Like me, I was one of them. Yeah. They knew something's wrong. Gina Daniel, who's a social worker in Pennsylvania, she did her master's thesis, <laughs> qualitative research in misattributed paternity after she discovered her truth. Her study was smaller. She only had about 25 people. But again, in her study, 36% of respondents said they felt different in their childhood. Again, kids know this. We know the secret. We, we don't have the ability and the language and the understanding to verbalize, hey, I think this is a case of misattributed paternity. I never thought that or could say that. But we know something's wrong. And then you get into these really difficult circumstances. I have a friend, her, her name's Jody Gerard, and her story is very public. She, uh, her father is African American. Her mother is white. She was born in the cornfields of Iowa, raised by her mother, married a white man. All right, you look at, at Jody for three seconds, you understand that she is not exclusively white. And yet, that is the environment she grew up in. That's what she was told. As, and as she tells her story, at an early age, she realized she did not look like anyone in her family. And she says, a quote, she hated the way she looked, end quote, right? And she talks about all the struggles in caring for her hair. And she knew there was something secretive, if not shameful, about how she looked. When she was in college, she started to meet a bunch of black kids. And they said, oh, yeah, you're black. She says, no, I'm white. And that caused all kinds of friction. She had a white boyfriend who did not want to introduce her to her parents, to his parents, because of how she looked. And it goes on and on and on and on, right? And then she now has children, and actually one of her children experienced a delayed medical diagnosis because she had a false family history. So it's not this false family history not only affects the person, you know, the MP individual, it happens over generations, right? And I just wonder, her pediatrician, longtime pediatrician, is deceased. She's trying to find her medical records. You know, what did he think? What did he know? What did he do? How did he assess her for various childhood illnesses, including illnesses that we know could be, you know, African-American and children's might be at higher risk for? You know, what happened? I, I just, I, I don't know. And did he knowingly tell her? I mean, I don't know. I'm only speculating. But, but she's not the only story like this. There is something particularly ugly about a healthcare professional knowingly telling a minority child that they are exclusively white. Doesn't just affect the person that's discovering that they're not parent expected, but also their children. Like this doesn't just affect one person. Like we're talking about family history. So like everybody that spans out from that, which I think a lot of people don't think about when they first hear about these situations. 
Right. And it can work the other way. Kara Rubenstein, who helped found Right to Know, you know, the Right to Know Your Genetics, she was told that her genetic father was a black man. So she grew up believing she was black and she grew up visiting all her paternal relatives. You know, she took on their identity and she, you know, their culture. And she heard the stories about the bigotry they incurred. And then she incurred bigotry. She talks about in childhood, people called her an Oreo. People called her a zebra. There was once a black girl who asked Kara if she was black. Kara said yes. And the girl hit her because she thought Kara was lying. And which technically Kara was lying, but she didn't know that. Right. So again, non-disclosure. This is the consequences of healthcare professionals purveying false information. It's not only psychological problems. Here's a case when her physical well-being was put at risk. Right. Then she took a DNA test. I think she was like 40. She finds out that she has zero black genetics and that she is, in fact, 50 percent Ashkenazi Jewish, which, number wow. one, is a very new identity. Number two, as you well know, brings with it a variety of unique health risks. She, too, has a child who experienced a delayed diagnosis of disease uh, because of a false ha family history. And then I, I spoke with Kara, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, and she was she's applying for this research grant. And on the form, you have to check off, you know, your ethnicity. And she like burst into tears. What does she check? What she grew up believing? What the genetic test says she is? What is she? What does she put down? The um, American Medical Association says you should share genetic information with the child, if appropriate to their age. And if you have findings that are not immediately rele relevant, they need to be shared later. If information is not disclosed, this quote should be done according to a definite plan so that disclosure is not permanently delayed. The American Academy of Pediatrics currently endorses adoptees' rights to their original birth certificate and other information. They don't specifically cite this for donor-conceived and misattributed paternity people. Again, I don't know why. Is that just an oversight? Is that by design? Adopting and that concept has been around for like forever, but donor-conceived, you know, like not parent expected, like I think that's a little bit of a a newer concept that we've talked about. Obviously that has been right. around forever as well, but like in terms of being acknowledged, but right. yeah, that's interesting that like adoptees that they kind of mentioned, like should have certain information. It's like, well, shouldn't more people in this situation be in included in that narrative? Yeah. I call it the genetic triad. You have adoptees and it's clear adoptees let, you know, back 10, 20 years ago, they led the way on increasing genetic transparency. I would say right now the donor conceived world is having their their moment, if you will. There's been a lot of media, particularly the the, the um, you know our father documentary, which was among Netflix's top ten most watched documentaries for several weeks. It's a must watch if you're if you're finding a lot of what Richard is sharing to just be very you know, interesting and you're getting fired up about it, I would, I would definitely recommend watching it. It's, it's not for younger audiences, but it's, it is, it is a very eye-opening documentary, Our Father. It's on Netflix. And I would point out Dr. Klein, that was a doctor. He is a two-time convicted felon. He was not convicted for using his own firm, sperm to inseminate women without their knowledge, which personally I think he should have been. He's actually convicted for falsifying documents. And that brings up a big question in terms of when you're, you're um, non-disclosing discovery of misattributed. What are you documenting? Wow. I mean, this is all so interesting. I wish we had even more time on the show. <laughs> um, as we're kind of, you know, starting to wrap up, is there anything that you want to leave the audience with? For those of you who might be favoring non-disclosure, you know, a couple of thoughts. Number one, what's your end goal? Right. How, how do you think this is going to end? Because, again, is it just you? I don't want to deal with this. Let's push it out the door and let someone in the future deal with it. That that doesn't sound very therapeutic to me. So that's number one. Number two, what are you documenting and what are you verbalizing? And are those things going to come back to haunt you, particularly in a court of law? Right. Their fertility fraud is now a criminal offense in, I believe, nine states with more coming. So, and I personally have had conversations with politicians in my state about, uh, you know, perhaps criminalizing non-disclosure of discovery of misattributed paternity. One, one politician said to me, well, we already have laws about that if the, if the professional is documenting, falsely documenting stuff. So, so again, certainly what I try to do in all my years and what I witnessed in so many of my colleagues, again, yeah, difficult truths, they're difficult, but they're the truth. They're the fact. 
present the information with, with empathy and sympathy as best you can and help the patient through it. And I, and I think back to my own mother, my own case, all the, you know, my mother died in 2004. I will never know exactly what occurred, but all the information I can uncover, things that I witnessed during my childhood and things I've learned in the aftermath, everything indicates that my mother was sexually assaulted and I am the result of that. And everything else indicates that my pediatrician, who was also her obstetrician, was aware of the situation and did not guide her towards the authorities or anything along that line. And that's just, you know, that's just terrible. That's just it wrong. Is. And, you know, non, non-disclosure of misattributed pregnancy, you might be hiding a sexual predator. Non-disclosure can also hide medical error. That, that's one thing before we go, I want to point out, there's this assumption that the only reason misattributed paternity could occur is because the, the mother, you know, bumped into her old college boyfriend one day and things, you know, things happen. While certainly that could be a reason, again, we don't have good data about this. So if somebody needs a research project, there you go. But it could be because of medical error. Was a child, you know, you had Libby Copeland on as a guest, uh, as a, guest yeah. a while back. Her whole book is about children being switched at birth. And people say, oh, that happened 100 years ago. Well, in 2019, the Joint Commission came out with their newborn identification directive because even today, newborns are being, being given the wrong medication, they're, the wrong procedures being done, they're being given the wrong breast milk, and they're being discharged to the wrong family. It still right? happens. Like it This still is happens. not something that's like, oh, it's before EMRs and technology. It's like, no, no. it still no. happens. No, as you know, we were talking about beforehand, I'm a certified professional in patient safety. Medical error is an enormous problem in the United States. There's some research that says it is the third leading cause of death behind cancer, cardiovascular disease and cancer. Third. Yeah, so, That's wild. Right, right. It's, you know, whether it's third. I actually got in an argument with a colleague once. They said, no, it's not third. It's not. It's seventh. And I thought, well, okay, if it's seventh, how is that better? It's still bad. It's still bad. It's still bad. Yeah. And I, medical and I've error heard, can be I've an heard explanation. that stat before. Yeah, we'll have to find. Maybe you can send me an article to look And then one, to, but... one more quick thing that's pertinent to, to your world, chimerism could be a reason why, right? There was just a report this year in the European Journal of Genetics of a paternity issue because of, you know, false paternity because of chimerism. Which and is no such one considers a fascinating that. genetic concept. As you said, my, my uh, story was published in the Journal of Genetic Counseling recently, and the journal published a response by one of your former mentors. And, and uh, that response, obviously, I don't agree with many things that were said in there. But the one thing that troubled me was the very last sentence of that article, which says there is no one size fits all solution to the question of how to handle misattributed paternity. But lying, fudging, and avoiding the truth should no longer be our default position, end quote. And I must say, both as a person who uses healthcare and as a healthcare professional myself, I find the idea of lying, fudging, and avoiding the truth as a default position as repulsive, right? That simply should not be. And I, you know, that is something that absolutely needs to be addressed in the genetics. Where did this come from? Where did this acceptance of this idea even come from. And then I would ask, what does lying look like on, you know, frontline day to day? Is that verbal, knowingly verbalizing information you know is false? Is that knowingly documenting your information that is false? Is that knowing making clinical decisions based on false information? And if you do those types of things, if you're documenting, knowingly documenting false stuff, are you putting any sort of, you know, safeguards or alerts in there so subsequent clinicians don't further propagate that? And I would ask, when the truth does finally come out, what accountability should there be for these professionals who have engaged in this type of behavior? Or do they believe that they simply you know, have permission to lie with impunity and should not face any accountability? And then one thing, and that's one thing about the guidelines too, they don't specifically say that a child should be told at some point in their life, right? I mean, is, is that what they're advocating, that a child should live forever with a false genetic narrative, which is a reasonable conclusion from the available information. And I, and I want to ask too, what, what exactly did I do to merit this? Why, why couldn't I have, children are by definition at risk group that merit healthcare professionals special protections. Why didn't I and people like me not, you know, why don't we get that? I, you know, why, why are we apparently undeserving of that? I don't quite understand that. You know, a closing thought on my end, I think, is that 
it's very important in all situations to include people that are affected by situations in guidelines and things that we're developing that are are for them or designed for them. So in these situations, having people that have been through a not parent expected situation be a part of figuring out guidelines and weighing in on this, just like we do with everything else of like including patient advocates in, you know, conversations and different aspects. So I think that that really should extend to this. So, you know, I, I hope that we can have more people that have your expertise and personal experience that are, are being able to contribute to this and having their voice heard, because I think that's just so important. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to capture that on the show. And just recognize in a world of direct-to-consumer DNA tests, we're coming up on, I think it's, a, I read somewhere, we're coming up on 100 million sold. I mean, the idea that you can keep a genetic secret for very long, that's, that's just a fool's errand. For more information about today's episode, visit dnatoday.com, where you can also stream all 200 plus episodes of the show, including video versions of interviews recorded in 2021 or later. Any questions, episode ideas, guest pitches, or sponsor inquiries can be sent into info at dnatoday.com. Be sure to follow us on social media, especially so you don't miss a giveaway. We are at DNA Today Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and more. Please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. Here's a bonus. If you do and send us a screenshot, I'll give you a shout out on the show. DNA Today is created, hosted, and produced by myself, Kira Deneen. Our team includes communications lead, Corinne Merlino, video lead, Amanda Andrioli, outreach intern, Sonia Tanaiker, social media intern, Kajal Patel, and graphic designer, Ashlyn Anokian. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.